Father, we thank you for your kindness to us and uh, for your word. Your word is a big book, and it helps us to, uh, as we get into it, to see the big picture of what you're doing uh, from the beginning of time all the way to our, our, our destiny in the, in, the, in the future. So we ask that you bless this time as we, we look at the ways in which you have given us so much uh, theology, uh, understanding of you and understanding of all the things that are going on behind the scenes. And uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, this is going to be a little bit of review, but not much, because one of the things that we've been discussing is um, kind of when we first started, we talked about hermeneutics, right? Mm -hmm. What's hermeneutics? Whatever it is. <laughs> so that's kind of a fancy word, but what's hermeneutics? I don't know. Words. Words? Words and origins of. It includes that. Hermeneutics is basically the, the science or the art of interpretation. A Bob, what's hermeneutics mean? Elder. Uh, hermeneutics is the. Uh, a, a, a methodology of studying, which oh, is... Oh, the method of it, yes. it varies. Some people's hermeneutics are flavored. Yes, In my opinion, they have a presupposition to see the conclusion. But a good hermeneutic deals with historical background language. There you go, there you go. Good job, yeah. Elder Bob. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's how we interpret scripture. Basically, it's interpretation. Okay. It's, it's the science of interpretation. So hermeneutics... The short version. version. That's their fancy yeah. word. Yeah. But one of the things that we've been looking is that... Um, as Bob mentioned, when you when you look at hermeneutics, it involves various things. It involves language. It involves understanding um, what genre you're in, right? We're going to interpret the Psalms a little bit different than we would normal narrative writing. You know, when the Bible talks about um, God's eyes are looking to and fro throughout the earth, you know, the next question would be, well, what color is his eyeballs? You know, or God's hand, right? He, he lifted them out by a mighty hand. Well, how big is his hand? You know, does he have hands and feet and eyes and eyebrows? You know, and so when we look at the poetic language, we see that God hides the people under the shadow of his wings. Does God have wings? Is he a chicken? You know, is he like an angel that has wings? So we, we look and we understand all that. But one of the other things, so we see history. We, we've been looking at a lot of context as it relates to understanding what we've been learning in the ancient Near Eastern context. Um... But one of the, the, the main things that we, we see is theology, that um, the Bible is not exhaustive. So when a writer sits down to write something, uh, they're not just in a trance, you know, dictating it, you know, uh, you know, like you would imagine somebody channeling a spirit. They're sitting down with their own personality, their own history. I mean, we look at David was a shepherd, Moses was a, you know, a, a shepherd also. You look at Paul, was a Pharisee, very intellectual, Greek-minded. So there's a lot of different types of people, backgrounds. But when they sit down to write, basically when we say theology, we say they have a purpose. What are they writing about? And so for us, one of the things that we've been seeing is when the, uh, you know, if we take Moses as the, as the author of Genesis through Deuteronomy, He's writing with this purpose, and he's giving us little hints. He's raising up certain things. And so what we've been seeing is uh, the, the battle between the uh, God. And, remember, okay, so we'll say it this way. Maybe you guys can refresh me. Because, uh, so I like to do it like this. We've had this over here. This is the physical realm. This is the unseen realm or spiritual. And then uh, mankind... We were meant to be God's vice regents, right? He created us and we screwed it up. But God is up here. Um, and then he's surrounded by all these other, um, um, right now, his divine counsel, right? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so this is important. As we, 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 There's angels, um, Michael, etc. Okay. So we have these unseen angels. Variety, we, that's given what we're using the basic word. Um, but they interact with us, and, and we're not allowed to interact with them. And so one of the things that we've been discussing is the idea of Elohim, these gods, um, little g, that have rebelled and are now in battle against God's plan. And so we know, you know, we, we know about Satan for sure, but um, one of the things that, that we're going to see today is uh, 
Uh, if you haven't ever read Deuteronomy, uh, I encourage you to read Deuteronomy because Deuteronomy is not boring. Um, when you start Genesis, Genesis is pretty good because you got narrative there, and Exodus is pretty good, and then you start getting into make the you know make the tabernacle you know fifty cubits and make the ark three cubits, and you're like, oh wow. Or then you get into Numbers and we and Leviticus, all these laws, and we kind of fade out, and then we never get to Deuteronomy. Where Deuteronomy is tremendous in what it presents because it is after the 40-year wandering, he's just getting ready to send them back into the land, or into the land to, to, for, to, for the conquest under Joshua. And he rehearses basically their history. And it's, it's really neat and it's engaging, in fact. But um, what we want to see today is I want to jump because I want us to see the messaging that's going on between... Um, for sure, Yahweh uh, against all these other, I'll, I'll use the word fallen, all these other fallen Elohim. And really the whole Old Testament is about this, this battle, right? Uh, we saw it when, when they came out of Egypt, God's, God says, Yahweh says, I'm going to, judge the gods of Egypt, the, the fallen Elohim, the, the gods of Egypt in that regard. And then he says to them, um, okay, you guys are special. I've chosen you, and you get to have me. Remember, there was a distancing between at the Tower of Babel between all the other nations, and he says to them, you get to have me as a special relationship, and I've chosen you. I've created you, actually, because you weren't around. You didn't have any... Um, you didn't have a nation. I created a nation, and therefore you get this special honor of having me as your, as your God. Okay, so I want to just jump in here really quick because um, if you don't mind, unless somebody else wants to, maybe I'll look at the camera. But I just want to read this and just let it sit and gel with us a little bit and to see what Moses, how Moses is talking to the Israelites as they're about ready to go in. He says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, he goes on all of them, verse 2, and when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. We saw that last time about being devoted to destruction and genocide and all that. You should not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters to be yours. For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and would, he would destroy you quickly. But you shall, but thus you shall deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their asherim and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a holy people, or a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So, right here at the beginning, what's the risk that the Israelites would serve other Elohim? And this is always, I mean, this is such, is this practical today? Is this really what's going on in, in today's world? There's, there's the Creator, there's Yahweh. And there's always the temptation for mankind to go seek other things to worship. In, in, our, in the West, it's, te it's typical, we, we think in terms of idols of money and sex and you know, pleasure and all these other things. But in reality, you could say those are just extensions of serving anything other than Yahweh. So this, this, this risk here is is the background and theology of all of the Bible in that uh, when God created Adam and Eve and their destiny is to rule and reign as his, as his vice regents, um, Satan comes along and says, hey, if you eat of the tree, you will become like the other Elohim, knowing good and evil. So, and, and, and when he recognized that, that there's no, uh, when, when, Satan shows up, Eve is not surprised. She's not going, oh, where'd you come from? I've never seen you before. Yeah. You know, th there's this interaction between the unseen realm and the physical realm of these other Elohim moving around. I mean, that's a little bit of conjecture, but we're just surprised at the way it's written that Eve is not shocked that she's talking to this other being. 
And, the, and, and when he says to her, you will become like the Elohim, she didn't go, well, what, are you, what Elohim are you talking about? Um, it, it's very clear there. And that's why later in Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve have fallen, God says, behold, they've eaten of the tree and they've become like one of us. You know, and we can think Trinity, but I think it's broader. It's, hey, they become like one of the divine council, the Elohim, knowing good and evil. All right, so um, let's go to verse 7. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh king. Know therefore that the Lord, that Yahweh, every time it's capitalized, that's Yahweh. Know therefore that Yahweh your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. You shall therefore be careful to do the commandment and the statutes and the rules that I command you today. And because you listen to these rules and keep and do them, Yahweh your God will keep with you the covenant and the steadfast love that he swore to your fathers. He will love you, bless you, and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain, your wine, and your oil, the increase of your herds, the young of your flock, and the land that he swore to, you, to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among your livestock. And Yahweh will take away from you all the sicknesses and none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which you knew. He, will he inflict on you, but he will lay them on all those who hate you. And you shall consume all the peoples that Yahweh your God will give over to you. Your eyes shall not pity them, neither shall you serve their gods, for that would be a snare to you. So right here, what do you see? Obedience. You see the, the risk of serving these other gods. And um, Yahweh is very jealous, right? We know he's a jealous Elohim. And... Uh, if you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember what Yahweh your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. The great trials that your eyes saw, the signs, the wonders, the mighty hand, and the outstretched arm, by which the Lord your God brought you out. So will the Lord your God do to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. Moreover, Yahweh your God will send hornets among them until those who are left and hide themselves from you are destroyed. You know, I freak out if one bee is chasing me, you know? <laughs> Can you imagine? I was thinking about this when I was running the other day, about God sending hornets. And there's, there's no way, what can you do? Yeah. Unless they didn't have nets. I was thinking about this while, like, yeah, I'd go to battle with nets. But in reality, God took a little, and he'd wiped out all the armies because you would have to flee. There'd be no other choice. Um, so let's see, um, let's turn the page and go to the next one. He talks here and is rehearsing them about this, the wonderful land that they're going in. Uh, let's look at, um, let's look at verse 8. Uh, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey. A land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron, and out of the hills you can dig copper. You shall eat and be full, and you shall bless Yahweh your God for the good land he has given you. Take care, lest you forget Yahweh your God by not keeping his commandments, his rules, and statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you eat, eaten, have eaten and are full, and have built good houses and live in them, when your herds and flocks multiply, your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up, and you forget Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And he goes on. He says, look at verse 16. Who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you, to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. You shall remember Yahweh your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to the fathers as it is this day. 
If you forget Yahweh your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. So when you look here again, Moses has got to give this last instructions to them. We look and we go, what's he after? What, what does Yahweh really want? Obedience. Praise. Precious worship. He wants obedience. Um, we'll put under that worship, because worship implies obedience, right? He doesn't want any like, mixed devotion. Yes. It's separateness. Um, Loyalty, is that okay? Yeah. <clears throat> really what he's after, and I would say the same thing for us. What does God want from us? He wants us devotion. He wants loyalty. He wants obedience. He wants worship. Nothing has changed in the sense of what he expects out of us. And, you know, I guess one of the things that we can ask in, in the whole message of the Bible is, what does loyalty and worship look like in the spiritual life? Back then or today? Help us, help us out. What does this mean? Maybe be personal. What does it mean to you? I worship Yahweh. Well, back then, it really looks like a contract. It's reminding me of Deuteronomy 28, where it's... Oh, for sure. It's, it, it, it's kind of a give and take thing with it. Remind us what's in Deuteronomy 28. Well, it's, just, it's blessing and cursings. Mm -hmm. Primarily, you're blessed if you obey and follow and do and, and submit. And you're cursed if you're, if you're not. You're, you're going you're gonna to lose this. And it's, there's three elements here. There's the blessing, the cursing, and then there's the obedience. And the loyalty, God, God's wanting that, but I think what mankind actually does is we just need to see blessings and cursings, or you know, benefit and like things go well, like you have honey and you have gold and you have you know all this stuff is, and you forget who God is. Yeah. So we get the, the the thing that God created becomes our idol, it becomes our attraction and our motivation, the carrot, I suppose. So, so the carrot becomes our focus, and we take our eyes off God, right? And that's how many times in here have we seen? Don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, and you start allowing this other form of, of loyalty or worship to others. Go ahead. Linda. Well, I see obedience and worship as different. Obedience is sort of like what Bob's saying is like you're given specific things you have to do, and if you don't do what you're supposed to do, then there are consequences to what you do. Whereas to me, I think worship is more like glorifying God, thanking Him, um, recognizing His benevolence and His love and, and all He's given to us. So I, yeah, I don't see worship as something where it's a, although it is mandated. Yeah, I mean, I, so. these are, they're, they're distinct, but they're not, they're, they're entangled together, you know, because certainly, it, remember, um, you see Jesus' comments, talking about, remember Satan tempted him and he says, no, I'm to worship, the, and, the, and I worship the Lord and serve him only. So you have worship and service. And you look at those words, and they're all very similar, but they're distinct in, 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 in ways, for sure. Um, because, you know, if we obey God, that is, is obedience part of our worship. But it's also acknowledging him and praising him and exalting him and uh, what else does loyalty look like in, in our spiritual life? I know. Um, you asked what it looks like in our own lives. Like, mm -hmm. uh, personally, um, a lot of times it's uh, ideas and concepts uh, that are vying for my attention. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for me, like loyalty is uh, holding everything that I am ingesting either professionally or personally. Mm -hmm up to what the Lord has said and not, because uh, there's a lot of ideas that I really like that aren't biblical. They okay. feel really good. Okay, sure. Um, and um, to really grapple with that uh, because like the, I go back to when um, like the, the Elohim said in the garden like, oh, did God really say? Did God really okay? say? Um, and so that temptation is always there, like uh, with with everything. With um, do I how do I trust God with raising my kids, with being married, with counseling, with all of that. 
and there's so many concepts that are slippery. Yeah. And so he wants me to be mentally uh, loyal. He wants me to use my mind and know how to think yeah. and be able to not to go on these trails of philosophy that have underpinnings that are not godly, yeah. even though they look really good. Yeah. And so those are the things for obedience to me. Is It's not so much like sinning physically anymore. That was when I was younger. But it's more intellectually. Yeah. Will you, Jeremy, will you read 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5? Because, again, we, we understand worship is distinct. It's, it, it goes along, it's kind of all under this big, you know, um, loyalty, we could say. But when we talk about either worship or obedience, let's bring those together. Um, how do we define, how can we define obedience? Obedience to what? You mentioned it, but what do we obey? God's Word. God's Word. So, we're looking at the Word, right? Okay. God has given us instructions on how to worship. Remember in Leviticus 10, uh, he had given some very clear instructions about how to approach the, the, the tabernacle. And uh, Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's kids, they said, oh, you know what? Let's, let's, do some, let's have fun today. Let's, let's go worship God the way we want. Let's get some strange fire. This would be fun. And so they decided to worship God in the way that they desired. They went outside of how God had prescribed. They go in there, they offer this strange incense, and God lightning bolts them, and fire comes out and fries them. Dead, crispy critters, right? And now imagine that you're, this is right in the beginning, and imagine you're Aaron. And Aaron goes to Moses. His two boys just got fried by God. Because they were choosing to go outside of what God prescribed. And so Aaron comes up and it's kind of says, what the heck? Moses, these were your nephews. These are my boys. What kind of God are we coming? You know, Because this was new, right? They, they, they had just come out of the, the land. They had only known of God a little bit here and there, maybe less than a year. And Moses says, this is what Yahweh said. That when you come to be in his presence, we need to regard him as what? Holy. 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 Which means separate. God wasn't unfair to Nadab and Bayou. They had clearly understood what the rules were. They just decided to disregard him, and maybe God wasn't that serious. And after that, it, when Moses said that, hey Aaron, this is yeah. what he said. He, he, he's not wrong here. He warned them, don't come don't be creative in your worship of me. Don't go beyond the word. If you do, there's consequences. And it said, and Moses or Aaron held his peace. He just like, what do you say to that? He's like, well, I, mean, yeah. I used to say that to my kids all the time. You know, I would say to them, "Have I wronged you?" Because I would bring a discipline, and I'd say, "Have I wronged you?" And I'd say, "If I was unclear, they well, I didn't know." And I go, Are, did, "Did you really not know? Because if you didn't know, then then that's my fault. I should have." This was the rule. This was the consequence. And so many times I would give them, I'd say, okay, you know what? So we're writing it down now. I mean, I wrote it on paper. I'd have them sign it. Boom. Now you know. And so the next time they disobeyed, the consequence would come. And I, I, I know they hated it. But I'd say, have I wronged you here? Why are you mad at me? You clearly understood. This was the rule. You chose to disobey it. Now the consequence. Why would you be mad at me for fulfilling what we agreed on? And this is the same way. That's basically what Moses said to Aaron. Hey, we all agreed. Remember that day when we said, Do you, are you going to follow me? And we all said, yes, yes, we're going to follow Yahweh. This is great. But the key for us is, is the word in the sense of the word that we have, the Bible, helps guide our worship. We're warned not to serve other, other gods or other things. And then when we go outside, we choose to sin and to disobey and disregard and go our own way. And we're all that way and selfish. And then we get consequences, and then we get mad at God. And God's like, why are you mad at me? I, I shared this to you. you. Clearly, this is there for you to read. It's not my fault if you don't want to read it. Um, but God holds us accountable. And so part of 2 Corinthians 10, will you read that for us, Jerry? 4 and 5? The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they are divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretense 
every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So, thank you. These, these fallen Elohim, what are they offering? What do they offer up? Different way. False thinking? I would say you're right. Right. False ways? Yeah. Arguments? Philosophies? Uh, just like it was said in the beginning, did God really say that? And so the, the messaging that we get from the beginning is always, hey, I'm your creator, you owe me worship and allegiance. And I, but like he says here, man, I'm going to bless your socks off this way. I'm going to bless you here, 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 here. And man, look, I, all those diseases that you got when you're in Egypt, I'm going to protect you from those. But Satan comes along, they come along and say, did God really say this. Did God really say that you have to worship him in this way? Come on, Nadab and Mike. Be creative. Add a little bit there. And they go and they do, and again, they, they get killed. And just like um, the other example that we saw was when David was bringing the ark back. Remember this? And they go to get the ark. They're putting it on a cart, and they're bringing it along, and everybody's excited. David's dancing. We're bringing the ark back, man. It's been in the hand of the enemy. This is awesome. And they're, they're bringing it, and the, they, they, the, the, the cart stumbles, and the ark is getting ready to fall. And Uzzah, great guy, loves God, wants to protect the ark, reaches out to steady and grabs on the ark, and God kills him. And David was mad about it. He was like, you know, he was scared. Well, if this is the case, remember he sent it over to Obed's house, and God blessed Obed for three months. Because why? What, what did the word say? Carry it on two poles. Put it on poles. Don't you dare touch the ark. Put it on poles and you carry the ark on poles and they put it on a cart. And that, so David got smart. He went back and read the word and was like, okay, let's get it from Obed. He's blessing Obed's socks off. I want the blessing here in Jerusalem. Go get the ark, but put it on poles. And God said, great. Now you're being obedient. And nobody gets struck dead. Didn't he add sacrifice about every 10 years? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yep. Just, to, just as a case, just to come to the back. <laughs> so, what we're after, the, the theological messaging, is this battle that is taking place between God, Yahweh, the Creator, and these other false things, these false God, Satan and all the minions and the fallen angels and all that, and, and demons, all, all the things that we've been discussing. And um, so, let's see, let's go to verse 19 there. He says, just a reminder, if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them, see there's the servant worship is together, and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. So this is where you have, again, obedience, serving, and worship all together. Hear, O Israel, you are across over the Jordan today to go into dispossessed nations greater and mightier than you, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the sons of the Anakim, remember we saw them, whom you know and whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? These were the Nephilim, these were the, the, the offspring of the angels and the women, and the land was full of them. Um, he says, Know therefore today that he who goes over before you as a consuming fire is Yahweh your God. He will destroy them and subdue them before you. So you shall drive them out and make them perish quickly as Yahweh has promised you. Do not say in your heart, after Yahweh your God has thrust them out, it is because of my righteousness that Yahweh has brought me in to possess the land. Whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that Yahweh is driving them out before you. Not because of your righteousness or the upright, uprightness of your heart are you going into this land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, Yahweh your God is driving them out from before you that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Know therefore that Yahweh your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. He wants to make a point. Man, what is the message? Yeah. You are not good. This you is not because don't, of you. Don't get a big head. It's not you, it's me. It's not you. 
And not only that, but as we discussed last time about genocide, the Bible often gets accused of having genocide in it, that it was the wickedness of these nations. And God had given them 400 years, we, we know that from Genesis 15, to repent. And they didn't. And God said, hey, Abraham, I'm going to give you this land, but not yet, because I'm going to give these guys 400 years to get their act together. That their iniquity is not yet complete. It hasn't come up. And then by the time it comes back, they are wicked. They're sacrificing their children. They're into bestiality. They're into all sorts of sexual sins. And, and you name it, everything under the sun of worshiping of all these other Elohim and, and just pure evil. So here we are. Um, they're, going, they're getting ready to cross the Jordan. Okay? And Moses and the rest of Deuteronomy is kind of sharing all the way to, as Bob mentioned, at Deuteronomy 28. If you obey me, man, I'm going to bless your socks off. If you don't, I'm going to curse your, even your toes off. You know, all you have to do is just be loyal. I mean, that seems simple, doesn't it? Until we recognize in our own life, you know, sin creeps up on us and we choose our selfishness or whatever. So let's, let's fast forward here. Again, we're just looking at some themes. In the book of Judges, um, you know, you're talking, they go into the land, that takes them a few years to conquer it, and then um, Joshua ends up dying. So let's go 50, 60 years later. Okay. It says, and they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them, and they provoked Yahweh to anger. And the rest of the book of Judges is the cycle, right? They go to serve all these other gods, these other Elohim. God says, okay, fine, you abandoned me. Then I'll, they get attacked by the Philistines, by the Midianites, all these other groups. And they get overwhelmed, and then they, they whine, and they cry out, oh, Yahweh, please save us, we're so sorry. And um, so I'll give you an example here. So let's go to verse 10. Um, this is Judges 6. I said to you, I am Yahweh your God. You shall not fear the Elohim of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. And, you know, what we saw last time was, uh, what, what does God owe these Israelites? Wrath. Wrath, right? And he flooded the whole earth because of sin, and he started over. And, and remember, the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. And he had given them all these miracles of taking out of the land of Egypt, of, of dispossessing all the wicked nations. The question for us is, does Yahweh, does God have a right to be angry? Oh, yeah. yeah. So what else do we learn? Okay. So what have we learned so far just from Genesis? If you're just reading the Bible and you're, you're taking notes on things. What are some of the big themes that you've learned from Genesis 1? The book of Judges is, you know, the sixth, seventh book. What have we learned so far? People can't be good. People cannot be good. <laughs> Humanity, we have a problem, okay? We are not good. Now, that doesn't mean we're, we're Hitlers every single day uh, going out. But there's something wrong. And we're selfish, and we choose selfish things, even to our detriment. Imagine, you know, you have this option of God says, hey, if you obey me, I'm going to bless you. But if you don't, I'm going to curse you. Well, I'm just going to choose selfishness today because I want to be cursed. I want to be subjugated. I want an enemy to come in and take my family away and to, to take all my crops. And what is it about, well, he did say, what did he call him? Stubborn? Stiff necked. Stiff necked. Depends on your version. Are we stubborn? Mm -hmm. Why are we so stubborn? Goes back to the original sin of, of pride, thinking that we can do it ourselves. Yeah. We can make ourselves righteous. What what does uh what does autonomy mean? We want autonomy. Oh, yeah. What does autonomy Self -law. mean? Self-law. Self-law. I'm a law to myself. That's two Greek mm -hmm. words, right? I want it. I don't want anybody ruling over me. I don't want some, you know, uh, God in the sky, woo, you know, fairy, fairy tale God in the sky telling me how to live my life. We think we can control. We think we, we're in control, right? We, oftentimes we do. We love our own sin. 
We don't want to give it up. <laughs> so this is, this is, we have something here. We, we are learning something about humanity, and we're also le learning something about Yahweh. And then we're learning, I would say, we'll put one, two, and three here. This is, so far, again, this is the messaging of the Bible that we're getting. That we do have an unseen adversary, right? That's mm -hmm. what we're talking about. We do have... Uh, we have human adversaries, but we also have this evil realm. There's some, some that are there. We also have good angels. But we learn that God is holy, that he's righteous, that he's good, and that he expects us to do that. Comment? No, oh. I'm just observing. So, and we learn this about us. And what we're learning, too, is that um, how do we solve this? It's been solved for us. Yeah. I mean, back then. I mean, if you're thinking, you know, Yeah, then you think the law, does the law really help us? We've been talking about in Galatians. The law just makes me feel bad about myself because I can't live up to it. And then I feel worse. And I'm like, and so ultimately I go, man, Lord, I, can you give me something to help me follow you in a way that I don't screw it up? And that's where it, it's forcing God is forcing this, this imagery of this battle of getting us to where we call out, we need a Savior, we need a new heart. That's the new covenant. Again, we'll talk about that later. But all along is this idea of not forgetting who God is. Well, this, this is on topic to some degree, but obviously we've got the indwelling Holy Spirit, which definitely improves our game. I mean, after the New Testament. Yeah, yeah, after the New Testament, we've got the indwelling Holy Spirit sanctifying us. And we're, we, we, through a process, we're becoming more Christ-like. Back then, the Holy Spirit wasn't given. They were just given rules mm -hmm. and obedience and commands. Behaviorism. Basically. Behaviorism. So they, they literally just had to be moralists. They had to just mm -hmm. to choose to obey God's moral high ground. Now this, this is where <laughs> we're going a little off topic here. In Christ's millennial reign, what's, what do you perceive? We're, we're talking to my kids about this yesterday morning. What what do you perceive the ruling from Christ in Jerusalem, ruling mankind? We're we're there helping out as as believers. Is it going to be the indwelling Holy Spirit granted to people to obey? Because they'll be it's going to be the same thing. But people are born; they're going to die. They're going to be born under God, under Christ's rule. Uh, do you think it's going to be similar to this, where they're going to have to obey in the same way? The theocracy was set up? Well, what, what, what I see in Scripture is that they will be living like we are, in the sense they'll have the Holy Spirit. Okay. They'll, they'll be given the new covenant and the new nature. But the new nature doesn't guarantee 100% obedience, right? So they're still, however, even as Christians, okay, let's look at it this way. Um, as Christians, do we ever get lost in our way sometimes, even as being true believers? Yeah, of course. But imagine that uh, there's a lot of freedom that we have as believers, being filled with the Spirit. But imagine it being a little stricter, that you didn't have a top-down approach there. Jesus is ruling with a rod of iron, um, and, and discipline was quicker. I think that would help us. Because we do have the Holy Spirit. Man, if I got a line, man, I got slapped. Whoa, okay. So that I think that would help in some regard. But it doesn't solve the sin problem. The only thing that solves the sin problem is the new nature helps. But we're still trapped in this body, right? That's why we still sin. So those people are not going to have their new bodies yet. They'll be exactly like we are right now, except there'll be no fallen Elohim tempting them. There won't be, okay. There won't be, because Satan is put away. He's, he's, he's put in the prison for a thousand years, right in the pit. All the, the demons, fall angels. But, again, this helps us to understand another thing. The overall messaging from Genesis all the way to Revelation 19, at least, through the millennium, or into 20, I would say, is that humanity still put them in a paradise where there's loving Jesus, right? The, the Lord, the Savior, the compassionate one. He's ruling and reigning, but there's something still, even in the heart of us, I mean, you guys know this, what is it in us that still seeks or longs for sin or rebellion, even as a Christian? And it's this physical realm that we have, and that needs to be redeemed. And so God allows sin to have its reign all the way to the end, to say, do you see the sinfulness of sin? 
So we can't blame anybody else? Nope. At that point. Because that can't blame Satan anymore. Now, we'll be in our new bodies resurrected, and, and that won't be us, because we'll be up ruling as in the, in the divine council. Humanity. But humanity will be given that opportunity for that thousand years to have born, to be born, and other things. And they'll grow up, and there's lovely Jesus. There's us teaching and guiding and telling them about the Savior, and they might, they might choose to get saved, and that's wonderful. But they still haven't got the new body yet, and they're still going to have the choices, but... With the other mankind, if you read Isaiah 65, 20, it's a little bit interesting. There are going to be those during the millennium that refuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there will be another rebellion coming up. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, after the thousand years is up, for God again, we might wonder, he lets Satan out for a period of time mm -hmm. to go out and to deceive the nations again. And he goes out and it works. And he goes out and he starts tempting people, and it's just a short time. But God is wanting to say, okay, guys, humanity and, and all the good angels, look, look here. My son has been ruling and reigning for a thousand years, paradise on earth. The lion is laying down the land. We have all these wonderful things. But let me show you the sinfulness of sin. Let's let Satan out and see. Surely, the angel, surely they wouldn't rebel after this, Lord. You've been so kind. You've given a thousand years of abundance, greatness. And he's, God says, just watch. Let's <laughs> Satan out. Tempts humanity, and th this whole group of people line up with Satan on their way marching to Jerusalem to kill Jesus again. Revelation 20. And God says, enough's enough. Second death. And then eliminates it, and then ends everything. Great white throne judgment. And then you get to Revelation 21 and 22, which is no sin anywhere. It's all redeemed, just like in the beginning, Genesis 1 and 2. And so you have these two bookends. But the messaging, the theological messaging in the middle is God is holy, we have an enemy, and man is stubborn. Well, isn't it too, I mean, I can't help but think, um, what you're pointing out is that we all have a sense of wanting to be our own little gods. Autonomy. We want to yeah. make law ourselves. Yeah. And, and that's just part of the, it's part of the knowledge of good and evil as well as rebellion. You talk a lot about in that millennium, okay, that they have choice. But what happened to God saves people? God changes people. You mean like election? Yeah. Yeah, I think election is there, right? Yep. So it's really not their choice to well, people, you know, without without in the sense of choosing happening to them. Well, well God. I would say this that you know as we went through this study, that anybody choosing to follow after God is still a work of the Holy Spirit. Right. But anybody choosing to rebel, God doesn't need to be involved in that. Right. So people still choose. They still make choices all the time. Yeah, right. But they're not going to be like, oh, I'm going to choose God on my own, apart from Jesus said no okay. one can come. Okay. Except so that's for the Father. That, of course. It, yeah. that's because it has to be. It has to be because that's a human yeah. nature problem. Right. But what you do have is in the midst of you have paradise on earth and mankind still making choices in their in the limited way that they do. Because they do have made choices for sure. But it's limited. Um, so I don't know what I keep looking. Okay, we got good. Okay. Let's on page two there. I'm gonna just wrap up the bottom because I want to get to something to bring us back. Um, Judges 10 there. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. What I wanted to do there was simply show you that these are fallen Elohim based on territory and people groups, right? And that's what God was saying to them is, look, you have all these other false deities that are these false gods, these spiritual beings, if you want to use that term, that are, that are getting, and they want worship, they want um, obedience, they want child sacrifice, all the wickedness. And all the nations around you, I kick them out of the land to separate that land to be holy. When you get in there, make sure you stay loyal to me and don't worship the gods of the peoples that are surrounding you. But they did it anyway. And that's the cycle. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, page 3, and he sold them into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the Ammonites, and they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. 
For 18 years they oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead, that's east of the Jordan. And the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah and against the Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed. And the people of Israel cried out to Yahweh, saying, We have sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and have served the Baals. Well, you would think, good job. You're admitting your sin. Okay? And the Lord said to the people of Israel, verse 11, Did I not save you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites, from the Ammonites, and from the Philistines? The Sidonians also, and the Amalekites, and the Manites oppressed you and cried out to me, and I saved you out of their hand. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the other Elohim whom you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. That's so scary. <laughs> Isn't it scary, God? He's patient, but... <laughs> he has a limit, and he abandons them. He's not going to abandon them fully. Because... Why? Why would God not abandon Israel fully? He makes God promises. He has promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's not he's going to fulfill that. But temporarily, he says, no, good luck. Go go cry out to your own. Because and, and now let's what do we learn? There's a couple other things that we learn here. Okay? These are other fallen Elohim that they're worshiping. What do we learn about the difference between worshiping the fallen Elohim and Yahweh? What do we learn from here? He's not going to stick with you. The fallen one is not going to stick with you. And, and I should have thought more. <laughs> He's not going to back you up and keep you from suffering. Okay. There's no mercy. There's no mercy? Right. Yeah. The, the fallen Elohim actually takes away from the goodness. Yes. Of what, what the blessings of the Lord. They, they require sacrifice. Jesus says in John 10, 10, the thief comes to what? Steal, yeah. kill, Steal, kill, kill and destroy. Yeah. And they have, I mean, think about this. If you were to choose, I guess, well, we do it all the time. We choose things other than God, and it doesn't often work out, right? Right. And then we go, well, why did I do that? that well, that was dumb. Yeah. Because I'm choosing uh, patterns you know, if, if God speaks about certain obedience things, you know, there's blessings in that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but yet we choose to go our own way, to be a law to ourselves, and then, you know, we end up suffering. Let's, let's say you, thou shalt not steal. Well, then you become an embezzler. And then you end up in jail. If you would have followed the word and not stolen, would you be in jail? No. But Satan comes and says, just take the shortcut, right? Just take the shortcut. That's what that's what he, they always offer. Come, you know, we'll let you do what you want. What's Satan? What's Satanism's main law? Lawlessness. What does Alistair Crowley say? In, in, do what thou wilt. Do what thou wilt. You be the law to yourself, and they and so they they trap and they offer all these shortcuts of worship. Do whatever you want, and yet there's a price to pay, and they end up having joy in causing suffering for their own worshipers. That's not the way Yahweh is. God looks out for us and says, the reason I've given you these is not to keep you from having fun or these. I've done this to bless you because in the long run, there's going to be pain and suffering even by your own choices. And so here, he says, how come your own gods, the ones that you worship, how come they don't save you? Because they don't care about you. And so for us, when we look at the choices that we make, Oftentimes, it leads to despair, depression, discouragement, a variety of things. And God says, oh, and, and I just wish you guys would follow me and obey me. Because I so, my heart for you is so much to bless you. But yet you just choose all these things. And God's, you know, like bewildered if he could be. Okay. Now, here in 1 Kings, we're going to jump ahead now. Because I'm trying to give you the, um, the uh, this overall messaging, right? So we jump into the kings, right? Saul became king, then David, then Solomon, and then you have the other kings. Jeroboam, this is right, this is when Solomon is about to die, okay? And this is where God, because what did Solomon do? Mm -hmm. Starts worshiping other gods. Foreign wives. Foreign wives. And Jeroboam comes along, and he's not a relative of Solomon. 
And God decides, I'm going to split the kingdom. I'm taking, I'm going to punish Solomon for his wickedness, and, but I'm going to divide Israel into two kingdoms in, in two tribes in the south and ten in the north. And so he comes to offer Jeroboam this. He says, the prophet says to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces of this cloth, for thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Behold, I'm about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon, and I will give you ten tribes. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, Milcom, the god of the Ammonites, and they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and keeping my statutes and my rules, as David his father did. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him ruler all the days of his life, for the sake of David my servant, whom I chose, who kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand, and will give it to you. Yet to his son I will give one tribe, that David my servant may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen to put my name. So, what, what can we learn from this section of the overall message? What do we learn from, I've kind of highlighted and underlined some things. I see it again that God is making a lot of cho choices here mm -hmm. that not dependent on I mean there are those that they they chose the people chose to worship and not be faithful mm -hmm. and so God is choosing to do certain things um, but that he's also faith, faithful to what he said to David mm -hmm. and so that I don't know it's so encouraging to me sometimes life just looks like such a mess mm -hmm. that you're just like what the heck okay. you know and I love that there's like, that God chose to put the mess in here and yeah. say, look, I am still working mm -hmm. and it looks bad and there's going to be bad consequences, but it's still my, my yep. choice. I'm, a, I'm doing this. This is me. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. what, why would God exalt David so much? What do we know about David? He's a man after his own heart. He's a man after his own heart? And he's a sinner, yeah. As bad as, as, bad as he was. <laughs> what, what did he do? He was and never yeah. disloyal to God. He murderer. was an adulterer. A murderer. A murderer. A liar. Yeah. Right? He's yeah. kind of... Man of war. Man of war, blood. Um, and here we have God saying, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, do this. But what's the big, what's the biggest difference between David and Solomon? According to this, say uh, David confessed. Okay. And repentance. And Solomon at the end uh, did not. He didn't not see that we know he did anything wrong. So he worshipped yeah. other gods. Yes, David, did. David never even was tempted to be disloyal. Mm. Never. Right. And, and here you have this idea that uh, verse thirty-four. God speaking, David, my servant, whom I chose, who kept my commandments and my statutes. Really? I mean, what we know is David was characterized generally, which is, I think, as Christians, we should be characterized generally by obedience, but not perfection. David clearly was not perfect. I and mean, that was some big sins, right? Murder. I mean, especially as the king, that was pretty serious. I mean, all those things, the, the lying, the, the murder, and the adultery, all those are capital crimes, mm -hmm. part of the Ten Commandments. But what we do know, never did he ever even offer a single bit of incense to any other god. And what I, what I see is the messaging here is for us is loyalty. And, and loyalty includes obedience in worship. I, I understand that. But if we were to elevate one thing to the highest of all of this... It's staying faithful to Yahweh only. That's what I see. Look, I just have a just a quick viewpoint. I I would be the confused when um, Solomon asked for wisdom, and when you get into study uh, Proverbs, it's just astounding his insight. Mm -hmm. He also speaks throughout um, Proverbs about immortality and going to heaven, and, and so. For, for this man to have, at the end, um, fallen so far short of what you would consider to be someone who's following God, and now I know we can't judge, and I know that we it's all in God's hands, 
But is Solomon in really big trouble here? Eternally and more in mortality wise? No, in no, other words, I, it's a silly question because I can't even do it, but man, I can't you, answer you fallen affirmative either way. Is he in heaven or hell? I have no idea. Yeah. But it does show that wisdom and knowledge do not equal art enough, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, it's and then a you go to Ecclesiastes, then you see a oh. whole different thing mm -hmm. in Ecclesiastes. Yeah. We, we don't get to God through intellectual pursuits. It's a spiritual thing, right? It's spiritually given. Jerry, what were you going to say? Well, it's kind of the same subject. I was thinking, he's, he says always to look on the outside. God doesn't look from the outside. And that's our obedience to the things that... He looks at the heart, right? Man the looks at the outward appearance. God looks at. And unfortunately, we don't uh, know what our heart really is. But God, you know, David's heart is pure. Yeah, and, and the thing is... He, he lacked some of this, but he never lost that. Another thing you have to remember, too, is David did pay for it. He had consequences of the all sword of his never sins, departed, right? From his but house. he still loved the Lord his more than anything. Child, child, and he wasn't his quick his to child. repent. You remember, there was at yeah. least nine months before after Bathsheba, right? Because yeah. the baby was born, and he hadn't repented yet until Nathan the prophet right. came. So, you know, even though he was a man after God, God's, God's own heart, he, we, we exalt him, and God exalts him. And, and you see this. They have, they have not followed in the way that my servant David. And that the example always is this loyalty that any of the kings that were that were bad, it's because they served these other fallen Elohim. David gives me great loyal. hope, I tell you. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's the key for us is we might sin, we might stumble, we, but do we yeah. still are we still loyal right. to to the God of Israel in that sense? And so um here, the next one, we don't need to read. This was just where God, the, the, the Assyrian king, has come to, now, now we're talking like 300 years after David, to Hezekiah, 700 B.C. The king of Assyria is making his way. He's conquering all the lands. Israel's already been gone. They got taken away in 722. They come to Jerusalem, and they have this taunt. Hey, don't listen to Hezekiah. You know, have all the other gods of the nations been able to protect them. I'm coming in and I'm taking Jerusalem. Your God isn't going to matter either. And what you have, you know, where are all the other gods, blah, blah, blah. Well, then he takes this letter. Hezekiah is so great. He takes the letter and he goes into the temple. He lays it down. He says, this guy's mocking you. <laughs> this is, well, we can't do anything. But now he's saying that all the other gods can, all the other fallen Elohim can't stand up to him. So Yahweh, we know you're the you're above all of it. What are you going to do? And, and Yahweh says, "No, I got this. Don't worry, and I'll take care of this guy." And uh, he won't even shoot an arrow here. But because you've acknowledged Yahweh, God sends out an angelic or well, the angel Lord goes out, kills 185,000 Assyrian troops in one stroke, and God. And we see that with Jehoshaphat too, good king. When they were faithful to Yahweh only, Yahweh came and he went above and beyond and said, Look, because you're faithful to me, I said I'd protect you. And all the, nothing will take you away. But as soon as you depart from me, and he kicks them out of the land, you know, later. Um, but I want to end on Psalm 8 because we got uh, five minutes here. The reason why is in, in Psalm 8... David is writing this. And so I want to add something here to, to the humanity section. Uh, we've been a little unfair to our brothers and sisters in humanity. Okay? We, we've been true. What else do we know about humanity from Genesis, you know, in the Old Testament, from Genesis 1 all the way. What do we know about humanity? Great in its likeness, image bearers. Yeah, we are image bearers. Okay, that's good. What does that mean? We have attributes that align with the Lord. Okay. I accept that. We're spiritual beings. We're spiritual beings. Okay. What else? We covered this pretty good. Okay. We're missing something super important here. Attributes is fine. That's kind of 10% of it. 
There's a lot of attributes. That's true. That's why I'm giving you 10%. Okay. 10%. <laughs> well, as it relates to the, the image. Holy? We're holy because he's holy. Well, in, in Christ. In Christ, but we're yeah. still not all the way there no, yet. No. We're wishy washy. He called us that. All right, fine. Uh, According to Copeland, yeah. we're little gods. Uh, uh, <laughs> rulers. <laughs> rulers. Rulers. Okay. Dominion. This is our, this is what we were created for. And we screwed it up. That's the messaging of the Old Testament is, gosh, we're falling so short, not only of God's standard, but of what God designed us for. And when we get to the end, the divine council, he elevates us to be part of his ruling council. That's what we were meant to do. We messed it up. Sin gets in the way. But in, in this whole plan of God from beginning to end, God is saying, this messaging, that's where we're at. What is the Bible about? Well, the Bible is about God's greatness. He, he creates us to be great too alongside with him, to rule with him. We screwed it up. Well, God wants to show his love and kindness. So he allows sin to have its reign, to show how deep it is. He comes up with the plan of Israel, sends Jesus to die on a cross. Why? So he can redeem us to eventually restore us to what? Rulerships. Our rulership. Should we be trying to be rulers today? No. Not yet. Well, I'm just wondering. No, that's fair. <laughs> because, and I'll, I'll answer that. Here's why. In Genesis 1, 28, we are given dominion. Go and, and subdue and rule, right? That never is repeated again until Jesus comes back. Okay. But in Psalm 8, what do we have here in Psalm 8? David is writing around 1000 BC, and he's remembering David was a massive, great king, right? God had ruled. I mean, he was ruling. Now, when you have a theocracy, David ruled as a king, accomplished, uh, beat all his enemies. God gave him peace on every side. And David's sitting here going, dude, this is pretty awesome. With God behind me, I'm taking out Goliath. I'm taking out this guy, this guy, this guy. I am ruling and reigning with no observable foe that can stand against me. But even in the midst of that, listen to what he says. He says... Uh, I saw him of David, O Lord, or Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? In the big scheme of things, we look and go, we're pretty weak. Okay? We die, we get old, we get incontinent, right? We, we end in a way that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, dishonorably because of sin. Now you think about that and you go, gosh, when you look at mankind, it's pretty pathetic how we end up. We get old, we get decrepit, you know, we get hunched over. He says in verse 5, here's the key. Yet, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly names, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. Where's David getting this from? Where's he getting this idea of being crowned with glory and honor? I have a footnote that says Isaiah 6 2 says, Above him were seraphim, each six wings, and two wings were covered faces. I don't know how that ties in with the Yeah, he, he there, he's just talking about the, the Elohim, the divine council. Okay, what did we say Elohim were? It's not fancy, just spiritual beings, right? Okay. It's interesting here that in the Greek version of this, which is quoted in Hebrews chapter 2, it says, For you have made mankind humanity, a little lower than the Elohim, than the heavenly beings. But in the Greek, it says this, for a short time. What does that mean? Not forever. It means that we get to come up here. That's why 1 Corinthians 6, 3, it says we will rule the world and we will rule and educate angels. Angels are in this category. It's fascinating that our destiny, the messaging that, that we get, is David is going, 
You have crowned him with glory and honor. He's thinking back to Genesis 1. He's remembering. And he's like, and he, he goes on. You have made him a little lower for a little bit of time than the heavenly beings crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet, all sheep, oxen, and all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. Oh, Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name. David is going, even though I'm, in, I'm enjoying a kingdom, I'm not enjoying this. And he's longing, he's looking back to Genesis 1 and looking at our destiny and saying, we know that there's going to come this moment when humanity is going to take their rightful place as God's image bearers, as his rulers, and we get exalted back up to where we're supposed to be. Like God, sinless, holy, perfected, but redeemed. And in, in the same way, when we stand there as these rulers now, we get up here to be humans, God's going to say to us, don't think you got here because of your own righteousness. <laughs> the same thing he said to Israel. Don't think it's because of your uprightness, because you're a <laughs> you're a stubborn people. It's because of my righteousness. I've redeemed you, and now I've done all of this to put you back to where you were supposed to be. But just you've done totally good with this, but just making sure for perfect clarity. We're elevated. We don't evolve to Elohim. Correct. Just, there's no misunderstanding. There's such a, an idea no, evolution of no, no. that we become angels. Oh, I'm earning my wings, so on and so forth. Yeah. We don't change. We, Why would you we settle for an, an angel when you're going to be up here? That's what I would say. Yeah. Elevated, not evolved. No, not evolved. This is something God does. This is position. Yeah, this is position, exactly. The great thing about angels, angels are awesome. The good angels, they, 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 they can say, well, I never sinned like you did. And you go, yeah, you're right. So humility is still there. But we also know that Jesus becomes a human. He doesn't become an angel. That's the whole argument of Hebrews 2. And he quotes this passage specifically in reference to Jesus because Jesus is a human. It's not only in reference to Jesus. It's reference to Jesus as being the perfect human. That he made Jesus a little lower for a little while, and he gets exalted back where he was, and we get exalted back where we were supposed to be in the beginning, but because of sin, we failed. You know, with all the, with all the, uh, the human beings who have died in the Lord, they're wearing white robes right now just because they don't have a physical body. Right. So it must be astounding to the angels to see the Lord as they're worshiping him, and he's in a body. He's a physical and body. They are, nobody's in, in, until the resurrection, right. nobody's going to have that resurrected body. So this is a strange time period. In, in it's heaven. interesting. And what we do know as well is we, we want, always want to wonder, we wonder about the motives of why does Satan rebel, you know, all these things. It, it, some speculate that Satan saw what was designed for humanity at their role. And he said, well, I'm not going to, who is this guy? I'm not going to bow down, not that, you know, the person that would bow down to us. I'm not going to allow this. I'm beautiful. I'm the, the anointed uh, cherub. I'm not going to let these schmucks come up and yeah, these humans come rule up. over me. Yeah. And so they go to de destroy us from our original calling. And it worked for a period of time. But God's going to get the victory. God's going to be vindicated. Is Psalm 8 where we've been trying to go for a while here? Yes. Psalm 8 is a reminder of what we're missing. When we read Psalm 8, David is going, he does say he was there. And if you notice, he doesn't recommand us to take, go take dominion. It's never, after we lost it in the garden, it has never been go out and take dominion again. He says, go out and multiply, Genesis 9 after the flood. This is a remembrance of what has happened. And David's like, even though I'm a king, this is what we're destined for. Hang on for the ride. It's worth it. It's totally worth it. Yeah, he wants to mean. remind us. He wants to remind us. He's reminding he us. What we were created. That's why Paul would say, hey, you've been saved. Rock worthy of your calling. Don't get stuck in this <laughs> disobedient stuff and a lack of loyalty. Come on, you're worth, your calling is worth way more than this. To serve God and to be obedient, walk worthy of that calling, your destiny. Don't get entangled in this, this stuff here. That's But vote Christian issues. Vote. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we are called to be active and be good stewards of what we have now. We, what did Jesus tell us? Be occupy until I come. Yeah. Do business. Get busy with the kingdom, promoting righteousness, etc. All right. Well, let's pray. 
Father, we do thank you that, uh, again, here we are reminded of this overall uh, messaging of the Bible that, again, you're holy, we have an enemy, and yet you, we have fallen from our original calling and destiny. But yet, through Jesus, uh, you have called us to be sons and daughters. That's what we're after here. These are, those are terms of, of rulership, being called one of your kids. And so I pray, Lord, that each one of us, that we would look and ask ourselves whether, we're lo whether we are loyal to you. Lord, that we, whether we're walking worthy of that tremendous calling, Ephesians 4.1, uh, that we're living up to that, that you called us to, and that as we think about how you are conforming us to be like Jesus, that we continue to grow. We're not perfect, just like David, but help us to be loyal. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.